Story of the Warrior and the Captive Maiden On page 278 of his book La Poussière, Barry, 1942, Croce, summarizing and shortening a Latin text by the historian Paul the Deacon, tells the story of the life of Drochtulft and quotes his epitaph. I found myself remarkably moved by both life and epitaph, and, later, I came to understand why. Drochtulft was a Lombard warrior who, during the siege of Ravenna, deserted his own army and died defending the city he had been attacking. The people of Ravenna buried him in a church sanctuary. They composed an epitaph in which they expressed their gratitude, contempt sit caros dum nos amat ille parentes, and remarked upon the singular contrast between the horrific figure of that barbarian and his simplicity and kindness. Terribilis visu facias sedimente benignus. Longaque robusto pectore barbe fuit. Note. Gibbon also records these lines in The Decline and Fall, chapter 45. Such is the story of the life of Drochtulft, a barbarian who died defending Rome, or such is the fragment of his story that Paul the Deacon was able to preserve. I do not even know when the event occurred, whether in the mid-sixth century, when the Longobards laid waste to the plains of Italy, or in the eighth, before Ravenna's surrender. Let us imagine, this is not a work of history, that it was the mid-sixth century. Let us imagine, Drochtulft, sub specie eternitates, not the individual Drochtulft, who was undoubtedly unique and fathomless, as all individuals are, but rather the generic type that tradition, the work of memory and forgetting, has made of him and many others like him. Through a gloomy geography of swamps and forests, wars bring him from the shores of the Danube or the Elba to Italy, and he may not realize that he is going toward the south, nor know that he is waging war against a thing called Rome. It is possible that his faith is that of the Arians, who hold that the glory of the sun is a mere reflection of the glory of the Father, but it seems more fitting to imagine him a worshipper of the earth, Hertha, whose veiled idol is born from hut to hut in a cart pulled by cattle, or of the gods of war and thunder, who are crude wooden figures swathed in woven clothing and laden with coins and bangles. He comes from the dense forests of the wild boar and Thurus. He is white, courageous, innocent, cruel, loyal to his captain and his tribe, not to the universe. Wars bring him to Ravenna, and there he sees something he has never seen before, or never fully seen. He sees daylight, and cypresses, and marble. He sees an aggregate that is multiple, yet without disorder. He sees a city, an organism, composed of statues, temples, gardens, rooms, tiered seats, amphorae, capitals and pediments, and regular open spaces. None of these artifices, I know this, strikes him as beautiful. They strike him as we would be struck today by a complex machine whose purpose we know not, but in whose design we sense an immortal intelligence at work. Perhaps a single arch is enough for him, with its incomprehensible inscription of eternal Roman letters. He is suddenly blinded and renewed by the city, that revelation. He knows that in this city there will be a dog, or a child, and that he will not even begin to understand it. But he knows as well that this city is worth more than his gods, and the faith he is sworn to, and all the marshlands of Germany. Drochtulft deserts his own kind, and fights for Ravenna. He dies, and on his gravestone are carved the words that he would not have understood. Contemsit caros dum nos amat ille parentes. Hank patrium reputans esse Ravenna suam. Drochtulft was not a traitor. Traitors seldom inspire reverential epitaphs. He was an Illuminatus, a convert. After many generations, the Longobards, who had heaped blame upon the turncoat, did as he had done. They became Italians, Lombards, and one of their number, Aldiger, may have fathered those who fathered Alighieri. There are many conjectures one might make about Drochtulft's action. Mine is the most economical. If it is not true as fact, it may nevertheless be true 
as symbol. When I read the story of this warrior in Croce's book, I found myself enormously moved, and I was struck by the sense that I was recovering under a different guise, something that had once been my own. I fleetingly thought of the Mongol horsemen who had wanted to make China an infinite pasture land, only to grow old in the cities they had yearned to destroy. But that was not the memory I sought. I found it at last. It was a tale I had heard once from my English grandmother, who is now dead. In 1872, my grandfather Boche was in charge of the northern and western borders of Buenos Aires province and the southern border of Santa Fe. The headquarters was in Yunin. Some four or five leagues farther on lay the chain of forts. Beyond that was what was then called the Pampas, and also the interior. One day, my grandmother, half in wonder, half in jest, remarked upon her fate. An English woman, torn from her country and her people, and carried to this far end of the earth. The person to whom she made the remark told her she wasn't the only one, and, months later, pointed out an Indian girl slowly crossing the town square. She was barefoot, and wearing two red ponchos. The roots of her hair were blonde. A soldier told her that another Englishwoman wanted to talk with her. The woman nodded. She went into the headquarters without fear, but not without some misgiving. Set in her coppery face, painted with fierce colours, her eyes were that half-hearted blue that the English call grey. Her body was as light as a deer's, her hands strong and bony. She had come in from the wilderness, from the interior, and everything seemed too small for her, the doors, the walls, the furniture. Perhaps, for one instant, the two women saw that they were sisters. They were far from their beloved island, in an incredible land. My grandmother, enunciating carefully, asked some question or other. The other woman replied haltingly, searching for the words, and then repeating them, as though astonished at the old taste of them. It must have been fifteen years since she had spoken her native language, and it was not easy to recover it. She said she was from Yorkshire, that her parents had emigrated out to Buenos Aires, that she had lost them in an Indian raid, that she had been carried off by the Indians, and that now she was the wife of a minor chieftain. She had given him two sons. He was very brave. She said all this, little by little, in a clumsy sort of English, interlarded with words from the Arakan or Pampas tongue. And behind the tale, one caught glimpses of a savage and uncouth life. Tents of horsehide, fires fueled by dung, celebrations in which the people feasted on meat, singed over the fire, or on raw viscera, stealthy marches at dawn. The raid on the corals, the alarm sounded, the plunder, the battle, the thundering roundup of the stock by naked horsemen, polygamy, stench, and magic. An English woman, reduced to such barbarism. Moved by outrage and pity, my grandmother urged her not to go back. She swore to help her, swore to rescue her children. The other woman answered that she was happy, and she returned that night to the desert. Francisco Borges was to die a short time later, in the revolution of seventy-four. Perhaps at that point, my grandmother came to see that other woman, torn, like herself, from her own kind, and transformed by that implacable continent as a monstrous mirror of her own fate. Every year, that blonde-haired Indian woman had come into the Pulperius, in Yunin, or Fort Lavelle, looking for trinkets and vices. After the conversation with my grandmother, she never appeared again. But they did see each other one more time. My grandmother had gone out, hunting, alongside a squalid hut near the swamplands. A man was slitting a sheep's throat. As though in a dream, the Indian woman rode by on horseback. She leaped to the ground and drank up the hot blood. I cannot say whether she did that because she was no longer capable of acting in any other way, or as a challenge and a sign. Thirteen hundred years and an ocean lie between the story of the life of the kidnapped maiden and the story of the life of Drochtulft. Both now are irrecoverable. 
the figure of the barbarian who embraced the cause of Ravenna, and the figure of the European woman who chose the wilderness, they might seem conflicting, contradictory. But both were transported by some secret impulse, an impulse deeper than reason, and both embraced that impulse that they would not have been able to explain. It may be that the stories I have told are one and the same story. The obverse and reverse of this coin are, in the eyes of God, identical. For Ulrike von Kuhlmann